Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Skeptics and Seekers. I'm your host, David the Skeptic, and I'm joined by my usual partner. Yep, I'm Dale, representing the Christian or Seeker side. Or absolutely crazy, irrational side. You pick. At any rate, who do we have in the third chair this week? It's none other than David Smalley. How you doing, David? I'm excited to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, wow. Just wow. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're just going to get past all the wows, and we're just going to get right into this thing, okay? Because we got a lot to talk about. Um, and it is my goal as a moderator to start a fist fight, if possible. So here are the rules. Uh, normally, we give all of our guests a, a strong heads up of what's coming up, and uh, we both know what's coming up, and we usually have notes, and we share those notes. David Smalley has no notes. Also, Dale has no notes. And so I am the only one who actually knows what's about to happen. <laughs> that scares me. I don't know. <laughs> this is going to be so much fun. So um, before we get started with the really fun part, let's let's talk to David a little bit. Uh, David Smalley, uh, you do Dogma Debate. How long have you been doing that? Seven years. Oh. Uh, uh, four years completely full time. So it took me about three years to get off of that old job situation. Wow. So, so you, you're seven. doing this for a living. Yes, sir. Yeah, I do that. I just do the podcast and uh, I'm a stand up comedian. I tour the country doing comedy. That's Those are my jobs. Okay. Uh, so do you ever get people uh, coming up to you and saying, hey, uh, so you're a comedian, huh? Say something funny. Uh, yeah. And then I just <laughs> stare at them. <laughs> You know, you're kind of asking for it when you say you're a comedian. It's like well, saying, I mean, when people ask me what I do for a living, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. I don't know. Truck worker, leave me alone. I don't know how else to respond to that, but yeah, I mean, uh, I'm like, hey, you can buy tickets to the next show and see all the funny that I do. But, um, Can't wait. I, I, I guess I could just be like, well, what do you do for a living? Well, I work at a tire shop. Change my flat, and I'll tell you a joke. Like, what am I, you know, no, I do it for money. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good. So uh, you do dogma debate. You're obviously successful at that. Um, have you ever been a Christian? Uh, yeah, I was. I was hardcore. I was. Uh, I was taking it straight to the veins. Uh, that Kool Aid. Okay. So, yeah, I, so I, tell I, tell us about that. How long were you a Christian, and when did you when did you get on board the Christian train? When did you get off that kind of thing? Um, I, I will use this as a moment to just shamelessly plug my book because I did detail this entire story uh, in Baptized Atheist. I recommend people get the audio book from Audible or iTunes. Uh, it is called Baptized Atheist. The original book was released in 2010, and then the audio version came out in 2012 with some corrections and mistakes I made in the original book. But the, the, the short version is um, pretty much my whole life as a as a you know, from the time I was born until, um, you know, I was about 15 or 16. Um, and I just, my drive for the truth is really what separated me, I think, from most people my age. Um, I recall being made fun of for being called Encyclopedia Boy. Uh, my my mom and my sister would taunt me uh, by calling me encyclopedia boy almost as an insult because what would happen and I would be eight or nine years old and I would hear them arguing about something that was a fact I didn't know the answer but I just knew there was an answer as a as a small child and so like they would be arguing about something like the distance you know the sun is from the earth and they would be in a heated argument about it and I found it to be so pointless to get so passionate and angry when there was an answer well, you just have to go find it and so I would climb up on this cabinet, and we had a, a – uh, God, I don't even know what this thing is called anymore. It's like a desk that also has a shelf above it. Mm -hmm. I know there's a name for that type of thing. I forget what it's called right now. But uh, I climbed up on that. We had this whole list of – this whole um, row of encyclopedias, and I would pull it out, and I would find it. And I would go over to them and be like, look, it's 93 million miles. The answer's right here. And rather than going, oh, thanks for finding that, they would go, shut up, encyclopedia boy. We're in the middle of something, you know, and they would go back to their argument or they would both just turn on me. 
And so I, I just always had this thirst for the truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't want to fight over things that had simple answers. And so uh, when I got really heavily into Christianity and was playing drums for uh, for the music ministry and touring, and we, we released a gospel album, and I was the I was the only white person in the uh, Black History program in my high school because I was the drummer for the gospel choir that was on stage. Yes, at a public school. Um, I I loved it. But then I started door knocking. I started soul winning, as we called it. And, you know, I just, I remember distinctly knocking on this one woman's door. And she said, uh, I said, I would like to talk to you about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And she said, honey, you need Jesus. And slammed the door in my face. And I remember thinking, what if she's right? What if she has the right version of Jesus on the other side of that door? And I'm out here leading people to the wrong version of Jesus. What if mine's not real? What if she's on the other side of that door with Jesus, experiencing actual happiness and knowledge and love and peace, and will go to a real heaven, and I'm leading people away from that? Like, that was scary for me. And um, when I was baptized, uh, you know, the preacher said something to me that really stuck with me. He said, you know, son, you can't just say you believe. You have to know it to be true in your heart. And... Amidst all this doubt and wonder, I realized I'd been given a jersey and pushed out on the field, and I knew none of the plays. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And so I made it my mission to read the Bible cover to cover, to talk with theology professors, preachers, pastors, priests, people I didn't agree with, and get so close to God I could resolve these issues. And I, I got so close, I saw that there wasn't one. And... Um, then I started on this mission of why do we love each other? Why, how, how can we continue to make this world a better place without religion? Is religion actually the cause for a lot of the problems? And I ended up being able to trace back a lot of our issues to religious influences and culture. And so uh, I made it my mission. My new mission became you know, to spread the word of humanism, love, peace, and uh, inspire other people to have the same thirst for knowledge that I did as a teenager. So – that's pretty much the summary of my story. But like I said, the details are in Baptized Atheist. Well, we'll make sure that we include a link to Baptized Atheist, and we'll include a link to the Audible as well, along with a link to the podcast Dogma Debate. Got a couple of questions about that. So what made you decide to start that podcast? Well, it started as a blog. It started as a, um, it used to be blogspot.dogmadebate.com. Uh, yeah. And I would go there and post just my general thoughts. So this was me going through my journey. I don't know that I was an actual atheist when I started. I mean, I, I, I was, looking back on it, I was. But I wasn't necessarily um, out and proud about it. Um, but I would post things and just see what would happen in the comment thread. And every Christian that would come there, every atheist that would come there, it started to devolve like every other debate forum out there. Immediate name calling, you know, the Christians were like, you're going to hell, you're going to burn, you're going to bow no matter if you like it or not. There's a place in hell for you. And the atheists were going, yeah, yeah, you you know, it's just uh, Santa Claus for grownups. You're all full of shit. And it would all get really nasty. And rather than deleting the comments or blocking the people, I would reply to them. And this is really my, what, what, what was my turning point in as far as popularity or people wanting to come there. I would, I would leave the comment there regardless of what side it was on, and I would just go, do you think this is the best way to get people here to understand your side? And inevitably they would reply with, well, probably not. Maybe I shouldn't have said it that way. Let me try to rephrase it. And I noticed by asking questions – And having people come up with their own answers to justify their behaviors, it was way more effective than going, you're being an ass, right? Mm -hmm. Or blocking them. And I saw people who first came there being so angry and so hateful start to shift their behaviors to go, I don't want to look like a jerk in front of these people, so let me word this in a way that's more respectful. And so carving out this little niche of respectful and lighthearted conversations around things that we all take very seriously is so important. And in a, in a forum setting, you know, you would leave a comment and then somebody else wouldn't reply for 24 hours, sometimes 48 hours. It was so slow moving. And I was like, what if, what if I just recorded conversations and emailed these people and said, Hey, let's hop on Skype and have a conversation. 
And that's how the, the podcast was born. It was a faster way to get information out that we had been doing uh, over the forum for years. So, so let, me, let me ask you a question that uh, many Christians ask me and perhaps some of our Christian audience is thinking about right now. So I get that you care about the truth. And you want you want to find the truth for you. You you want to do the right thing. You don't want to be duped. So we get that. But why do you have to ruin it for the rest of us? I mean, we've got our faith, and I get it. You're no longer in the club. Why can't you just leave us alone? Why do you have to go on this campaign against Christianity? Why do you hate Jesus? Because I love you. <laughs> it's... The exact same reason why, as a Christian, they will feel the need to talk me out of my atheism most times. It's why they knock on doors. It's why they call it winning souls. It's because even though they know I'm not in the group and that I've got my own system over here, they feel that theirs is better and more enlightening and more loving and has a better reward system. And they want to share that good news with me. They want to share the gospel. And I understand that. People knock on my door, they get an invitation, a cup of tea, water, and a microphone in their face. I don't push them away or tell them to stop knocking. I expect if you have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe, you should knock on everybody's door and tell them about it. If you honestly believe that's the case, that's what you should be doing. So I think it's a, a, a good thing that they're doing. And as a matter of fact, a lot of people don't know this. In order to maintain your 501c3 status as a church – you have to continuously seek new membership. If you stop seeking new members, you can legally lose your tax-free status. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's in the federal statutes. So it, it's not I, – I don't blame them for knocking on doors. So let me, let me get this straight. I, Evangelism is the law. <laughs> <laughs> in order to keep certain of it. Oh, Wow. <laughs> But as far as why I necessarily need, feel the need to, to talk Christians out of their faith, you know, I think that having a mindset in which one believes things that are extraordinary claims without that matching extraordinary evidence, it makes them susceptible to a lot of other dangers. If someone is spiritual but not really religious or they believe that they have some sort of communication with the dead or that they believe that they you know, are visited by angels or that God works in their life on a regular basis. When someone knocks on their door and tries to sell them snake oil, they are far more likely to believe that person's claims without evidence because they haven't been shown a true skeptic's guide to challenging claims. Um, also, when, when, when bad things happen in their life, it's easy to chalk it up to Satan working in their lives or them not being faithful enough. And they start to blame themselves and beat themselves up for things when it's not necessarily their faith or anything else that's causing it. And then when they do something wonderful or they accomplish something great in their life, they rarely take the credit for it. They rarely feel accomplished. It's God blessed me. I'm blessed. God did it. Praise be to God. And so you end up living this life where – all the good stuff goes to God, and the bad stuff is because you're terrible, you're broken, and Satan's working in your life. And it can be a very self, I think, mentally abusive way to view the world that you never really feel like you're in full control of your own destiny. You really don't take responsibility. You don't have to. And if you do take responsibility, you beat yourself up to the point that it's, it's abusive. It's self-abusive. And so I, I, I enjoy the process of watching people no longer fear things like hell and damnation. I enjoy people going, wow, I just realized I don't believe anymore, and this life is so important. It's not a practice run. The only way I'm going to have an afterlife is by touching people in a positive way and living on in their memories, leaving record for people to listen to after I'm unable to speak and let and, and allow my voice to continue reaching people and, and inspiring people to love one another. That's a true way to make a difference when you're gone. And one of my quotes that often gets spread around is, you won't be able to make a difference after death 
So be someone's guardian angel now. This is about humanism. This is about loving people. This is about reaching out and making a positive difference in the world today. And a lot of believers who feel like these 60, 70, 80 years are just a practice run and everything is about spending eternity with God, they can let these moments pass them by and they don't live the life they could. So I feel the need, because I love humanity, to talk people out of their faith so they can have a real life here on planet Earth. So this is very missional for you, dare I say, a ministry? Evangelical even. Um, <laughs> I want to scream from the mountaintops, come talk to me with your questions about faith, and I want to tell you I once had the same. Okay. Do you mind if I just ask one follow-up? I, I know it's the interview portion for David, but yeah, just to see... Um, uh, so I get that you're evangelical for the purpose of humanism and you think it, it's good, uh, you know, to kind of disprove or, or get people to see the falsity of Christianity and religions and that sort of thing. Um, do you do you see that, let's say, a general belief in theism as also being detrimental to the cause of humanism as well? I do. I do. Yeah. Uh, e even if it's a generic, uh, maybe even a deistic God, it's 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 different levels, I think, like it's varying levels of it. I don't think a deistic worldview is quite as harmful as a theistic worldview. And then I don't think a theistic worldview is quite as harmful as a specific monotheistic worldview about this God who wants you to sleep with this person and wants the animal facing this direction when it's killed before you eat it or what you can eat on Fridays, you know, I think uh, there's different levels of it. But sure, I think letting go of as many metaphysical claims that don't have fact-based evidence to back them up is always better than having things that you hold on to as beliefs that you can't show or demonstrate. Okay. So, well, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I'm happy with that. So, yeah. Okay, ahead, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned fact-based because that's going to be the first thing that we talk about in the second part of this program, which is coming up very quickly. Before we get there, though, one or, one or uh, two other questions just for level setting. Uh, you have been talking to Christians in a kind of formal way uh, on the air for seven years. Surely you have heard some good Christian arguments. What's the best Christian argument uh, you've heard? Um, you know, I, I used to say that there was one and then I found out it, it was a misinterpretation. <laughs> so I, I can't use that anymore. I did, I did more research on it to realize it. It was something in Isaiah that said the earth is round. Mm -hmm. And that was something that made me second guess because I've always considered the Bible a flat earth book. Turns out the word in the original language didn't mean round. It, it meant circular. So, yeah, I couldn't take the spherical. But thing it, but it was a science based argument. Originally, yeah, yeah, and and I it did I did have to spend a little time digging into the original language before the translation, and then finding out what the word specifically meant. And I know some people who are super well versed in the Bible know exactly what I'm talking about. There's a there's a verse in Isaiah where Christians will point to and say it says right here that the Earth is spherical, but it it it's, and there are versions that say the sphere of the Earth. But the original language did not say spherical. It was circular. So it could have been a flat circle. So, um, you know, I, I guess the best argument, the best thing that I would say that that just makes me go, well, it's it's a point of discussion. I've sort of resolved this in my own mind so it doesn't bother. It doesn't keep me up at night. Mm. But what comes to mind is this idea of the soul. Uh, I know where it comes from. I know where the word spiritus came from. It was really just your breath, your breath leaving you, the Latin spiritus, mm -hmm. which is where we got the name spirit. Because all they knew was when someone died, their breath left them. They would say the spiritus has left the body. That's where we got this idea of spirit or soul. Um, it really just meant air or breath. But a Christian said to me one time, um, if I were to replicate you, with the greatest technology available, that person wouldn't still be you. There's something that separates you from an exact replica of you. And it just made me go, ah, there's something, there's what, the word essence, which most atheists hear and roll their eyes at the back of their head. There's some, a there's some essence, there's some 
different about me that wouldn't be in that other replica of me. Uh, what is that? What what what's different about me? It's a, a, a level of experiences and, and relationships. Yeah. Well, if you replicated me exactly, you would replicate those experiences. You would replicate all of that. But I guess at the end of the day, the moment the replication happens, even if it's replicated with all the previous memories that I've had, we instantly start experiencing things slightly differently because we're in different parts of the room or sitting across from one another in a couch. And, you know, immediately, even in that millisecond, I have a different experience than my replica. So I, I guess that would be the best answer for that. But this, this idea that you can feel things that you can't explain this idea, and even as an actor, I've, I've mentioned this before on my show, as an actor, I, I have to become other characters sometimes. And sometimes these characters are very, very intense. And that's as close that I, I think I'll ever come to a religious experience again, is becoming another character and then taking a while to shake that off before I can continue on with my day. Um, there's something really intense about embodying another person. And so I think that's the most intriguing part. It doesn't stump me. It doesn't keep me up at night. But I think that's definitely the most intriguing part about any spiritual argument, whether it be Islam or Christianity or Hinduism. It's, um, it's this idea that there's something there that we can't yet explain. And to me, that's a mystery of science that I think we'll resolve someday. But uh, for now, it's, it's fun to think about. So Dale is doing a series right now on substance dualism. I think he's up to part three. Oh, cool. Yeah. So um, oh. I know that I know that that is a uh, something that Dale cares about a lot, and I'm sure he is glad to hear you say that. <laughs> he's he's been given a lot <laughs> yeah. of confidence now. <laughs> Thanks, uh, David. And so instead of me being able to crush this stupid series of his, you've you've just given him fuel for another twelve parts. <laughs> Fun. It's fun. Man. It's fun to think about. <laughs> it really is fun to think about. It's it's a it's a blast. And I know that I you know it, I've been I've been in in uh, in situations where a director has told me about a character and I've, I have some lines to read. And a lot of times these are long scenes. These aren't just like a quick thirty second commercial. Like I'm talking about an intense scene on stage in front of a live audience. Where I have to become a person for an hour or more, and I can't really describe unless you're an actor and have done it seriously you really don't know what i mean it's it's a it, it's as close it's as close to an out of body experience that you could imagine and it's almost as though i'm still in there right and i know that i'm working i know i'm in the i know i'm in mission control but it's almost like the front half of my body is another person and it's this really amazing feeling that I'm I'm in mission control I'm pushing the buttons I'm still in there if someone were to come in and say the building's on fire I know I could abort and become myself and get the hell out um, but really strong method acting is um, is something that I think keeps a lot of Hollywood in the woo and interested in woo and interested in faith healing and things like that because you have to tap into parts of your mind that are so mysterious to human beings. So it's, it's definitely something I'd like to talk about at some point. I think it's, I well, think it's fascinating. Perhaps if this goes well, we can have you back and you can, you can actually have a discussion with Dale on substance dualism. I refuse to do it. Uh, so he's, he's looking for someone <laughs> to, uh, to uh, take the other chair. Yeah. I mean, I could do that. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that it's all happening in your mind. Yeah. And, and I think I could argue that point and we could get into that uh on, on that other series yeah so yeah i, I would love to do that but yeah. i you know it's, it's just yeah. something that's fun to think about yeah, yeah. I, so i was an actor in college uh myself i do i do know a, a little bit about what you're talking about now i wasn't great i was i was a i was the best singer the college had i was i was on scholarship for voice uh i was a lousy actor but it was opera and uh, singing was more important <laughs> so um, but I do, I do get you there, and I, uh, my time uh, with stage, uh, even at that level, uh, changed me a bit, I would say. And so that's that's a part of my life that I don't talk about uh, much now. But you you bring up some of those memories, talking about stage and acting. So as as we get ready to bring Dale into this and enter the second part, I want to transition with my final question. What's the weirdest theological opinion you've heard on your show? <laughs> and I and I know 
that you've had a lot of them because I've listened to a great deal of them in the last few days. <laughs> so you and I both inter- uh, interviewed uh, C.J. Morgan, a delightful uh, young man, uh, but I, I think very confused. Um, so, you know, maybe some of it comes from there. Uh, one of your shows, uh, I, one, a recent show, someone was saying, I think it was a preacher uh, who was saying, no, no, no one in the Bible ever wrote as if they were speaking for God. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I thought, whoa, that's, that's what inspired me to put this question in. I'm thinking, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> and believe it or not, that's not the crazy. I mean, that, that's that's up there. That's pretty interesting. That one's that one's definitely probably top five. I would say that as soon as you said it, I, I always I always want to trust my instincts. So, as soon as you said it, as soon as you asked the question, I had one thing immediately pop into my mind. And then as you started talking about previous guests, I was like, oh man, there's a whole list of stuff. We could be here all day with some of the arguments that I've heard. And I'm just going to go back because I have a lot floating through my head right now, but I'm going to go back to my original thought, like the thing that jumped into my mind as soon as you said this. It was, and it still is, it's, it's, it's this idea and this, there's a church in Dallas, and I referenced it on a recent episode, so if you've been listening uh, recently, you may have heard this. It's this idea that <clears throat> the, the Bible verses that are specifically about homosexuality are not addressing people who were born that way. It's only people who are straight and attempt homosexual behaviors specifically in a way to rebel against God. And the verses that they point to, of course, like Leviticus 2013, anytime atheists talk about Leviticus 2013, we go, it says to stone gay people to death. And it does. But there's an entire church in Dallas that says that's not what it says. Their argument is, if you read it, it says, if one lies with a man as one lies with a woman, he shall be put to death. Oh, well, if you're a straight guy who would typically lie with women and you decide to rebel against God and, and go lie with a man, then that's that's you. But if you've always been gay and only lied with and only lied with other men, then that, that verse isn't applying to you and we don't stone you to death. So did, and, did that did that include bisexuals? You know, it never addressed it. I think I think bisexuals are probably um, the only ones that they believe that that's referring to. They're basically like pick, you have, not pick one because you don't get a choice, but like if you were born gay and have never been attracted to women, then then you're safe. And God is not talking about you. Now we know in reality that's that's not the case. Obviously they, you know, gay, gays have been around for a long time. And uh, ever since humanity was around, there's been, there's been um, gayness just like there is in thousands of other mammalian species. Uh, and and these, these guys were recording this type of behavior and saying, it's bad, it's wrong, don't do it. Right? It's considered depraved or whatever. But yeah, I, I would say that, that that's one of the more astonishing. Um, and I've got one more, I okay. think, that, that was shocking to me. I asked a guy one time, and I've, I've asked this to probably seven or eight different people, and they've all given me the same answer except this one guy. He was a Christian rapper. And I said, um, if God told you, cause typically what I do is I say, if, if God told you to kill your kid, would you do it? And they always go, well, no, because God wouldn't tell me to do that. And it's yeah, it's well, what, what I call the Abraham that? test. Exactly. Exactly. Uh-oh, well, I this guy. This is going. Tara's going to go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, no, this, just, this... just so you know, Dale, I did not encourage him to bring this up. <laughs> Oh, it's fine. I, like I said, Dale, I Dale has gotten in trouble with uh, some of some of the audience with the Abraham test. <laughs> Ooh, maybe he's going to fall into my crazy answer. Because this guy, this guy said immediately, I said, I said, if, if God told you, he, he talked about his daughter a lot. He was really close with his daughter. And I said, if God told you to kill your daughter, would you do it? And immediately he goes, yeah, absolutely. Mm. He said, um, God has a bigger plan than I do. God knows more than I do. Um and essentially what he's saying is, I want, she's my child, not yours. Send her home to me. 
I, I want my angel home. And so if God told me to do it, I would do it. Just, it, just so easy to answer. Yes, he would. And I started going, well, what if you were hearing things? What if you didn't know? And he's like, you didn't say that. You said if God said it. I was like, yeah, but how would you know if it was God or not? What if it was an illusion? Like, it doesn't matter. If I hear God say it, I'm going to do it. And I mean, after that, I probably received at least 50 email people going, never have him back on because he needs religion. If he doesn't have religion, he's going to become a murderer. And I'm like, I don't believe that. I think that you think he needs that, but I think humanism would quite nicely take the place of that and we could introduce proper skepticism and he would get over this. Hump. I'm actually worried that religion would make him a murderer. He's, he's one seizure away from killing his daughter. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or a, a very realistic dream even that he wakes up from and goes, wow, God just told me to kill her. I mean, how do you distinguish that? I mean, there are tons of times in the Bible, including the virgin birth, where the information came in a dream. Right. And it said that it happened in a dream. I mean, I've had dreams about that. I've, I've woken up pissed off at my friends before, and it took me about 30 minutes to go, oh, wait, that didn't even really happen. They didn't, they didn't steal my dog and sell it. What the hell's going on in my dreams, right? It's just my dog's right here. So it, it's, it's, it, it can be so realistic. And so I, that, that was worrisome to me. So I would say that those two, those two distinguishing um, uh, ideologies or theologies would probably be the most strange to stand out. So I would, I would let Dale comment on that, but I'm not. I'm going to let him stew <laughs> on that for a little because we've got some things to comment. So I'm, I'm looking at the time. I think we've got enough time to cover these, but who knows? The conversation might spiral out of control. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to go into the second part of this very exciting podcast where no one has the advantage except me. Because I have the list. <laughs> and um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a topic. Uh, I've got five on my page. We'll see how many of these we plow through. These are topics that you have heard uh, Dale talk about uh, over the months. Some of them, uh, maybe not as much as others. If you uh, follow David Smalley, these are topics that you may have heard him uh, rebut over, over the years. But you haven't heard these two together. And so they haven't had time to prepare their best answer. This is, this is something that we want to see. I just want to, I just want to see what happens uh, as, as they face these things. Uh, yeah, and I, want to say, I just want to say, not only that, I didn't, I didn't even know I was debating today. Uh, this is, this, is, this not, is brand new. As a matter of fact, I didn't know that you had a Christian co-host until about two hours ago. So this is fun. I'm a, I'm up for it. I just yeah. I want to let when he says we're unprepared, he is a hundred percent right. Yeah. No. <laughs> and, and don't worry, I'm just as unprepared as you, uh, David. There, uh, and I'm not good at speaking off the cuff. I'm the type of person that likes having some prep and that sort of thing. So. Oh, I don't like I don't like prep at all. I think speaking off the cuff is my uh, is my strong so, suit. So. so good. So you'll have the you'll have the advantage in this. Then. Fine. So. Let's let's do it. I'm ready. <laughs> Ready to walk in with the unprepared advantage. Let's do so, this. So here's, here's how we'll do this. I will ask uh, one of you the question. Most of these will probably go to uh, Dale first. Dale, you will take two or three minutes to uh, explain your position on uh, this issue. We will hand the microphone over to David to give him a chance uh, to uh, explain his position. I want him to hear your position first because, quite frankly, it's, it's the Christian making the claims in most cases, and we are, we are saying what we think after hearing the claims. And so after that, we'll give you a chance to ask each other one question, uh, and then we'll move on to the next one. So these will be very quick. We're not going to resolve any of these at once, but I am curious to see what shakes out. Number one, the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, properly basic beliefs, and other ways of knowing besides empiricism. So I don't know if uh, either one of you have had a chance to listen to this week's unbelievable episode with Justin Brierley. Uh, it was uh, two luminaries uh, debating scientism. Stephen Law and um, Moreland, uh, J.P. Moreland. 
It was a great discussion. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Scientism is the notion that science is the only way of discovering truth, or at least it is the primary way of discovering truth. Everything else outside of science or the scientific method is unreliable. So this is what Christians call scientism. Only Christians use this word. It's kind of used as pejorative. And one of the things that I have been agitating on the Unbelievable Board this week is, great, well, I, I actually embrace scientism. I can be swayed. All you have to do is tell me another way of knowing that is more reliable. If you think there's a realm of information that science doesn't cover, great. Tell me how you know about that realm and how you determine its truth. And so we have things like the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, properly basic beliefs. Uh, in the Christian side, we, we, we have things like faith. Um, and so, Dale, I know that this is one of your favorite topics. You may not be great at speaking off the cuff, but I know that you are well-versed in this. Tell me why scientism is wrong and explain some of these other ways of knowing. Sure. So, uh, so in the first place, on an objective level, um, I think the scientific method is a great tool. It's one of the greatest tools that human beings have in order to come to a knowledge of truth. Um, I would disagree with scientism in the fact that it's it's not the only uh, valid avenue for knowledge. Um, for example, the historical method is another objective means of getting to truth, but that's not strictly following the scientific method. Uh, historical events aren't repeatable and that sort of thing. Um, furthermore, I think that the underlying principles which uh, validate the use of the scientific method and historical method, whatever you know, discipline you're studying, are underpinned by logic. Uh, so, and logic is a you know a first order. It's a part of philosophy, and philosophy is the first order discipline. So, I think there are other valid, objective avenues to truth. Um, but in addition to that, so David's alluding to, I also think there are valid subjective uh, evidences that can provide someone with knowledge as defined as a warranted true belief. Um, so what David's referring to, so, you know, you, you gave the Abraham example, and I know David wants to stay away from that, but what I might say with that Christian rapper is that um, maybe they're, God is speaking to them, so they're having a dream. That's the experience that grounds a properly basic belief. Um, now, properly basic beliefs can be defeated, of course. You, you could be wrong. Um, so that's why you got to ask, well, is it uh, proper with respect to warrant? Is it actually a warranted true belief? Um, so I, I'm not sure if David Smalley's familiar with Alvin Plantinga, pro probably is, and that sort of thing. But yeah, I think if you are warranted in the sense that a properly basic belief is warranted, and say it's grounded in the experience of the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, then that counts as knowledge just as well as scientific knowledge. It's produced by a set of cognitive faculties operating in a cognitive environment that is suitable um, for those faculties and is you know, successfully designed uh, or aimed at truth. I think I got that definition right. That's off the top of my head. But um, yeah, so that's my position is I, I think that there can be valid objective and even this subjective way through a properly basic belief that can produce knowledge. Um, so yeah, hopefully, does that make sense? Or? Sure. Yep. Okay, cool. So, so David, uh, theology is one of those realms that relies on these other ways of knowing besides empirical scientific uh, methodology. Dale has made a case that these methods are quite valid. What say you? Well, I want to throw you a curveball, David. Um, I want to address you for just a moment. <clears throat> sure. If I could do that. Sure. Yeah. David, are you addressing you? David oh. or me? Yeah, David. No, no, I'm addressing oh, David. Sorry. Just, right. just not to avoid the situation. I just want to. I want to do something fun for a second. Cool. David, do you recall the last dream you had? No. You don't. Have you ever had a dream? Yes. Uh, do you remember how recently? Oh, I, I'm pretty sure I dream every night. I just forget them fairly quickly. But um, I, so, so I don't, don't recall the last dream, dream I had, but I can 
I can recall a recent dream. Perfect. Um, do you know that you had the dream? Yes. Can you demonstrate that you had the dream? No. So you've obtained knowledge in a non-scientific way? Not exactly. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that it's completely non-scientific. Uh, although, right. I cannot... I mean, you can't, eat it, can't repeat it, you can't test it, we can't prove it, you can't demonstrate it, but you called it knowledge. Yes, I believe that I know that I had a dream. Although, it, it, let me let me let me clarify what I mean by no in this case. Yeah, there we go. I am I am almost certain that I am wrong about almost every detail that I think I remember from the dream that I think I remember. Uh, and this is this is the way of dreams. Uh, they are they are very slippery critters, and the moment you wake up, even if it's a, a, a very strong. Uh, emotionally uh, uh, moving event that that you had, you forget details. Uh, details are swirling around and changing, and by the time you wake up and and you look at it uh, with clarity, almost everything that you remember about it is wrong, except the the memory of the emotion of it. So I don't know the details of the last dream that I think I remember. But you bits know you and, had bits a dream. Bits and pieces. Right. But you know you had a dream. Yes. I know that I had a thing that people call dreams. I'm, I'm pretty sure that I am on board right. with understanding what people are, are calling dreams. Right. Uh, but you can't, the, yeah. the fact that you can't recall specific details or any of that, that to me that muddies the water. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Okay. You, you had a dream. Yes. And you know you had a dream. I had a dream. <laughs> but yes. you can't Sorry. demonstrate that to any of us. I don't so, I don't think so, although this is where my lack of science knowledge will hurt me. I it could be that a neuroscientist with the right scanner can demonstrate it. I don't I don't know that that is not something that can that can't be dis demonstrated. I can't well, do they it. Can only, I mean, they can only tell if you had a seizure, if you get a scan within like 42 to se uh, 48 to 72 hours. Like if it's been a week since you've had a seizure, it will not show up in any brain scans. But if you had a seizure 12 hours ago and go in for an MRI, they can certainly tell you, yeah, you, you had one. Sure. And so what so, I'm saying is in, in the same way, it may be possible to tell if someone dreamed uh, if you if you do a scan uh, right after and maybe the scans get better and we can we can see more details about the dreams when the length of the dreams. Well, again, sort of well, again, then then we also know that there are false positives, right? You can look at something and show like I, I went to a, I went to a doctor one time for a checkup and they said that I had a. a they checked my EKG and said I had irregular heartbeat and a heart murmur. So they scheduled me an appointment for a cardiologist, ran me through a bunch of tests, and the guy was like, you're perfectly fine. I don't know what the hell that doctor was talking about. Just sure, thing positive. happened to me, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Really? yeah just a, it's scary as hell. I had to sleep with this thing on. I had to go yeah. run for 12 minutes. It was awful. Oh, um, yeah, it's, you know, that type of equipment can show – false positives. So even though it can show up on the system that you had a dream, that's not, that's not knowledge. It's a, it's a symbol that is some sort of recognition that something happened in your body or something happened within the instrument that was, that was measuring that. My whole point in all of this is I think a lot of secular people or science-based people get caught up in this argument when there's really not a huge argument to be had. Um, I don't necessarily disagree with 90% of what Dale said, um, but I think we need to distinguish the difference between saying that you know something and being able to demonstrate that to then control the behavior of other people. I don't care that you had a dream. I don't care that Dale believes he has a spiritual connection to the creator of the universe. And you guys probably don't care about my dream that I had about my dog being taken and, and sold. It doesn't really affect any of us. But if I were to tell you, nobody from here on out is allowed to have more than two dogs because of my dream, you would want a little more evidence for me to demonstrate my knowledge before it becomes a control mechanism in your behavior.
that's when I care about your ability to demonstrate versus your comment that you know. To me, it only really matters when things become impossible and you claim to know them. That's when you start making those extraordinary claims and having no evidence to back it up. So I can say I know my mom is my mom. Well, do you really know? We're a lot alike. We have similar mannerisms. Yeah, but you could have picked that up because she raised you. We have the same blood type. We have this. We have that. We have. We can check to do DNA tests. Even DNA tests are 0.9999999%. There's always the possibility, right? But I say I know my mom. I, I, I mean, I, I say I know that my mom is my mom or my dad is my dad. I can say I know I had a dream, but I can't scientifically to, to the nth degree beyond all shadows of doubt, absolute, absolute certainty and prove this. No. So ultimately, it only matters when people claim to know things that are impossible, like a personal relationship with the creator of the universe. And oh, by the way, Here's who you need to have sex with. Here's who you shouldn't. Here's what you should eat on Fridays. Then before you start applying those behaviors and those rules, you need to start being able to demonstrate your so-called knowledge. Uh, sure. Uh, so I don't, I, I actually don't have a problem with that. And I think, I think you might overestimate <laughs> what I, um, what I think about the, term knowing especially knowing things like our internal state um I, I don't think that we do know our internal state really as well as we as well as we think we do uh we we have an experience and i've on an earlier podcast uh believe it or not i've given this as uh, to dale as what i think the best argument for the christian is <laughs> uh which is that I can't know your internal state. I can't be entirely sure of my own. And so I can't say with 100% certainty that God didn't talk to you, that, that God didn't give you some blueprint for the future. I, I don't know that. I can't, I can't say that for sure. Uh, but I also am not bound by your report of that if you cannot prove that to me in, in a right. way that is meaningful to me. And that's where the scientific method comes in. It's not a, exactly. it's not a matter that there aren't things that, that, that science can't uh, demonstrate right now. I, I fully agree that there are things that uh, science can't do anything with right now. But that doesn't mean that there is some other realm of knowledge that can, right? And so there, there are a lot of things that we don't know that we just don't know. Sure. And, and I'm open to knowing those things by other means, but someone is going to have to explain to me what those other means are. So if, if the thing is, well, but my inner witness, my self-report is a means of knowledge. Well, I would just say, no, it's not. Your self-report is extremely unreliable in a lot of things. And so a lot of the things that I think I know about my own internal state, I am perfectly willing to say, you know what, I, I could be wrong about that. And I would not argue with someone when they report their internal state. I would simply say, you're, you're going to have to do more to make me believe that. Sure. And yeah, just on my end, I'll, I will say I 100% agree with you guys that um, appealing to something like a properly basic belief is subjective evidence. It's meaningless to, to you, both of you guys, or to anyone else. I would never try to use that as evidence to convince you, hey, I'm right. I think the only way we can do that is appeal to either your own uh, properly basic beliefs or subjective evidences and or present objective evidences, which, you know, science is, well, the scientific method is one of the best means that we have. But even objectively speaking, the historical method isn't strictly see, speaking science. So yeah, I guess I just want to, I'm grateful that you both agree that scientism, at least in the way you define it, hard scientism or whatever, is false. There are different avenues to coming to knowledge. So, yeah, I think we all agree on that. Well, well I, look, I don't mind being called scientistic, uh, but okay. I also don't mind if someone says, well, you know, your definition isn't the classic definition. Uh, so that's fine. I, I, I define it simply not to say that there aren't things that are out there that are beyond the reach of science right now, because there are. 
Uh, what I'm simply saying is we don't have any better reliable way of exploring uh, those things than science right now. So I'm, I'm perfectly willing to, uh, you know, it, whatever the word open means, open to other methods of knowing and understanding those things. I, I just need someone to lay that out for me. I do not accept, for instance, the internal witness of the Holy Spirit as as one of those methods. I do not understand properly basic belief uh, enough to accept that as a method for knowing. That sounds a lot like presupposition when you talk it out. Uh, and so, yeah, I, what I what I am asking people like you, Dale, to do is really outline those other ways of knowing. Now, I know that you are perfectly willing to do that for ages. Uh, and so I'm going to, I'm going to stop you from going any further than that. But I was curious, uh, as you see, um, what, uh, what David's response would be. Yeah. And I'll just say, I really appreciated your, your response there. I thought it was very thoughtful and, uh, yeah. Thank, thanks for your take on that, David. Oh, cool. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you me, David or him, David? Uh, you, David, the, okay. David Smalley. He, 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 he does not appreciate my responses. Uh, <laughs> well, some, there are days. <laughs> when he's thanking a David, he means smalling. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that went well. I wasn't expecting to have uh, this much fun, but great. Um, I like curveballs. Number two. I'm going to give you this one to you, David Smalley. What do you mean by faith? I know that you think that faith is not a proper way of knowing things, but, you know, I bet you've had some arguments with Christians about faith, and I bet they've disagreed with your definition about faith. Um, is, 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 is faith, um, say, for instance... Uh, pretending to know things you don't know or is it something else when you talk about faith what are you talking about yeah my friend uh peter bogosian calls it pretending to know something you don't know uh, i talk with pete quite a bit probably once a week and i i disagree with him on that i find that definition a little harsh i would say that i think it's hoping that what you already believe is true um, and I think hope implies some sort of lack of malice as to where pretending implies um, intentional deceit. Mm. And, and I, I don't think most Christians are intentionally deceitful. I think most Christians genuinely hope the things they believe are true. Um, and so that, that, I think, is probably the biggest difference. I wouldn't even say that most Christians disagree with that. I think um, whenever I've brought that up on my show and I say, no, I, you know, whenever they say, whenever I ask the series of questions and they go, yeah, you're right, I don't have any evidence that that happened, or yeah, you're right, I don't know who wrote the Bible, I don't know who wrote this book, and I don't know who wrote this down, or if they're reliable or trustworthy or whatever, and then I go, then why believe it? After a long bit of silence, they tend to go, hey, that's where my faith comes in. And what they're saying is, I just really hope it's true that Jesus died for me and I didn't live this entire life as a waste. And um, I, I hope that it's real because they want to see their past loved ones. They want to experience eternity. They don't want to envision or imagine not existing. I know that's difficult for someone to to imagine if you haven't lived a lifelong journey of trying to find it and have come to terms with it and you first think about it in the middle of a conversation that's being broadcast to 100,000 people, you may be sh you know, a little shaken by that and go, I'm not prepared to deal with that at the moment. And so I, I understand, and I don't hold their feet to the fire. Um, I think it's more of a hope than it is pretending, though. I think you're a much nicer guy than me. Let me just ask you a follow-up just to return the curveball. Um, do you think that Christians hope there's a hill that burns with fire for all eternity and that will cook the vast majority of people who ever lived? Do you think they hope for that? No. no. No, I think they hope they're wrong about that, to be honest with you. I think most Christians hope that either on your deathbed or immediately after you die, you get a final opportunity to join them in heaven. 
Um, I think if most Christians were able to vote, the vast majority would say that they hope that hell is one of those mistakes, that it doesn't really exist. It was just a sort of a, a threat of time out for people to be a different way or a, a translation error or something else. And um, I, I don't think most Christians want to see people tortured. There's a handful of, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. folks like my friend Brian Fisher on American Family Radio who might go, yeah, you deserve it. You burn in hell. You know, there's, there's a couple of pundits and, and maybe fundamentalist Christians who really hope there's going to be some atheists that are suffering. But I don't think that's the majority of Christians. I think the majority of Christians are really, really nice, loving, thoughtful people who are trying to live their best life in accordance with pleasing Jesus and pleasing God. I don't think they want suffering for people. So I agree with you, but that's where I have to give Peter Bogosian some due. Because it's not just hoping for the positive things. Faith is not just used as as a way, a, a stand-in for the happy things. It's also a stand-in for all the bad things. You uh, talk about things that you know God did in the Old Testament, and you have faith that those things had maybe a good purpose or or whatever. But they're bad things. Uh, hell is a bad thing, uh, and so at some level there is a little bit of pr- pretending, if not convincing yourself that you know things that you really don't know. Well, I mean, that, that's when the definition of faith really needs to be broken down, because when you look at the original terms, I believe it was the Latin la bona fide, which meant, uh, which means like bona fide. That's where we get the idea of bona fide or real or truth or authentic. Um, but then you also have faith, meaning is your spouse faithful? Are they loyal? Can you trust them? Is it something trustworthy? The word faith uh, gets tossed around in many different ways. And I think whenever Christians are talking about, if you were to say, I've never heard a Christian say, I have faith that there's a hell. I've literally never heard that sentence. But I think if I were to word it in such a way to back them into that corner and say, do you have faith that Jesus rose from the dead? Yes. Why? It says so in the Bible. Do you have faith that there's a heaven? Yes. Why? It says so in the Bible. Do you have faith that there is a hell? They would have to say yes. But I think in that instance, they may not mean hope, but they might mean the, the form of faith that means trust meaning I trust in the spiritual text that talks about Sheol or whatever place of damnation or punishment. And some people then translate that into meaning hell is just living without God or hell is not existing or hell is some sort of you know nihilism or whatever. Um, but I, I think that even when Christians use faith, they use it in different ways. They use the term in different ways depending on what they're saying, just like everything else in the English language. So I would say that when they talk about having faith in hell, it's more of a trust faith, like they would trust and have faith in their spouse. Uh, I, as an atheist, have been, you know, balling up a sheet of paper to throw it across the room and go, hey, guys, you think I'm going to make it into the trash can? And they go, no. And I'm like, come on, have a little faith. And then I throw it. I don't mean it in a religious sense. I'm like, trust me, I'm good at this. You know what I mean? So I think, I think taking the word faith connecting it to pretending and applying it like that across the board in every possible use is is mis- misunderstanding how florid the, the English language is and how much we've you know completely brutalized the original biblical text um, but I, I'd still I, I still stick to the to the point that I think most Christians do not hope for a hell I think they would just say they have faith meaning they understand and trust that when the Bible talks about it, it's a real thing. Otherwise, they would have to say that the Bible's not true, and that opens up a whole new can of worms. Okay, good answer. Dale, give a better one. What, what do you What do you um, mean when you talk about faith? Sure. So believe it or not, uh, a lot of the stuff that um, David Smalley was, was saying there does resonate. I, I take the view that faith, you know, five days means trust. So that's sort of, you know, it could be trust in a proposition. So... In the fact, in terms of is Christianity true, the, the proposition of that, um, I'm, I'm kind of weird. I have my own method where I actually assigned subjective probabilities and using Bayes' theorem, I, I calculated it out. So I, I'm about 53.14% convinced that Christianity is true. So you can say I, I'm trusting and acting as though I'm, I'm on the assumption that it is in fact true even though I, there's that possibility that it could be false. Um, another way that the Bible speaks about faith is 
So, okay, given the proposition that Christianity is true, um, let's pretend I'm convinced the resurrection evidence is very strong or, or the evidence from the Shroud of Turin or something like that. Um, other doctrines, such as the hell doctrine, or um, in the New Testament, it's talking about faith in the second coming or, or something like that, things you haven't seen. Um, so I trust that those doctrines are also true because they're sufficiently attached to the core proposition that Christianity is true. So in that, in that way, they could be an evidence-based faith. Um, so yeah, that that's sort of my take. With, with hell, um, I would say I have faith. I, I trust that the doctrine is true, um, but obviously I don't want it to be true. I, I mean, I, I would hope, uh, my hope is that universalism would be true, um, but I, I know that's not gonna be the case from the Bible, at least some people will be condemned. Um, and yeah, I, I would just say on the hell issue, I, I do have a slightly different uh, understanding of what hell is. I don't take a torture chamber model. Uh, I more hold to a quarantine model of hell. So it's it's still bad. Um, it's still not a place that I would wish that uh, anyone would go to. Um, but yeah, so that's that's where I, I would say I have faith in its existence, but it's it's not that I'm, yeah, you know, burn, yeah, I get what you guys deserve or something like that. So, yeah, does that does that make sense? Sure. Did you want to follow up uh, with a question or observation, uh, David? No, I'm fine. Okay, so I can I can tell you uh, something about Dale's Hill. Uh, we had a discussion uh, uh, about this. We've we've talked about this hell, and uh, CJ has a very particular uh, some beliefs about hell too. But uh, this quarantine view, by the time you're done discussing it um, with uh, with someone like Dale, it sounds like a pretty nice place to go. <laughs> so <laughs> that that might have been the way I was describing. It. I didn't mean to. I just meant to, so I view hell as like the relational absence of of God kind of thing and um which is which so. is fine right <laughs> yeah so. no and, and apparently i think all my friends and lots of porn stars and strippers are going to be there i don't see a problem so far yeah. <laughs> i described it as uh new york without the christians okay <laughs> <laughs> so. it's like vegas where all the cool yeah. people go what are you talking about <laughs> yeah. Well, okay yeah i would just say that the, it's a little bit more than like where god's still relationally present in this life so it's not exactly fair to say that it's going to be like New York, but it's, yeah, by the same token, it's not like you're going to be poked with a pitchfork or something like that. So, uh, yeah, yeah, fair so enough. So let's, let's ask you know, a little you know, bit. David, Go ahead. You know, David, I, I will say one follow-up thing about the faith. Um, so, since you asked the question, I, I did have something pop into my mind. Sure. I, I don't really have a problem with how we defined it. I, I think we're pretty much on the same page when it comes to these things. I just want the Christians listening to stop and think for a moment about this question. In whom do you hold that faith? So when you look at the, when you look at the Bible and you go, I have faith that Jesus rose from the dead. Why? Well, it's written in the text. It's, it's written in the Bible. Okay. Who wrote it? Who transcribed it for that author? Who translated it into the language you speak who copied it there are 94 i believe different versions of the english speaking bible so like i mean bibles don't speak but you know what i mean of, of the english versions of the bible there are 94 different takes on that and then you've got the original texts that are in languages most of us don't read and we don't have the entire books from most of these and there are count like thousands of countless scribes who were writing things down or the original copy edits, people were literally just writing it over and over, and there are samples showing that people were making changes and then getting in trouble for making their own changes without their approval. There's no telling how many of these changes happened, how many things are different. So when people say, Jesus said X, Y, Z, and I have faith that, that in Jesus, I go, wait a minute, how, how do you know that Jesus said it? Your faith is in an unknown person who wrote down that Jesus said it, and then your faith is in another group of unknown people who transcribed this, who translated this, and who passed it down into the version that you're reading today. So you say that your faith is in Jesus, 
But I think your faith is in countless of anonymous, random people who you have no idea have credibility or not. So as Christians think about faith, think about where that faith actually is. Is it in the, in the story? Or are you really just trusting a lot of random, anonymous people? Dale, 30 seconds. Oh. Uh, so, okay. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that is a fair enough point. So I'm, uh, I, I'm actually a biblical errantist. I do think there are errors in the Bible, um, definitely from the preserved manuscripts. But even in the original autographs, uh, I, wouldn't, I think that there might be a few errors there as well. Um, so, yeah, I would just say in terms of having faith, uh, so in the preservation of the text, I, I think that the Bible... Whatever errors are allowed um, in the Bible, and this might be a, a question David Scott coming up, but I believe in the um, super supervisory model of divine inspiration for the Bible. So um, whatever has come in terms of the translations, that has to be s sufficient for what the Bible says is important for achieving salvation or for um, living a good Christian moral life. Um, and, you know, coming up with Christian doctrines, it, that doesn't necessarily apply to coming up with scientific knowledge about how old the earth is or that sort of thing. So there is, a, there is an element of faith that with a supervisory model, God is using these human agents as instruments and preserving the text in such a way that it's sufficient uh, for the purpose of divine revelation in the first place. So, yeah, that's my take. Uh, so before moving on to the next question, I'm going to break my own r rule and weigh in on faith. Uh, I don't, as it might come as a surprise to some of the listeners, I actually don't care <laughs> if, if a person has faith, e either definition of faith. I think that faith is an ill-defined religious term uh, that has lost all meaning today. Uh, it is extremely fluid. And therefore, it's kind of meaningless when Christians use it because you don't know what they're talking about at any given moment. And I'm not sure that they know what they're talking about at any given moment either. It just depends on what pushback they give. So by all means, have faith if, if that's what helps you sleep at night. My problem with faith is when it becomes what Hebrews describes it as, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. It becomes a stand-in for evidence and substantial things. And people start talking about things with greater confidence than their evidence can support. So it is one thing to say, you know, I believe that the universe is like this. And I, I think that there might be a heaven and there might be a hell. I'm not sure. I am not certain, but these are the things that I believe based on my worldview. I don't have a problem with that statement, but it is when preachers uh, preach as they have done for ages and scared little boys and girls into uh, baptisms and staying in line and preaching with certainty things that they know that they can't know for sure. Yep. That's when I have a problem with faith. Agreed. So um, again, that, that goes yeah. back to the original question and, and why I address it the way I did as far as say what you say, what you know, but in, if you want to control my behaviors, that's when you need to bring evidence. And, right. and that kind of draws both of those together, I think. So these these last few get a little bit more difficult. So I'm going to I'm just going to introduce uh, number three, real seeker, true Christian. I've put these things together over the course of our podcasts. um Dale has uh, stepped out of his Canadianism to say some pretty mean things to me. I know that you find this hard to believe, David Smalley. Shocking, yeah. He has told me things like, I am not a real seeker, and that I may have never been a true Christian. I have no, no idea what these things are supposed to mean. And so I'm going to give this one to Dale... Uh, Dale, take take two or three minutes to define these terms. Let's see if we can come to some agreement or a punch okay. in the face. Either way, I'm happy. Real seeker, true Christian. What are you talking about? Okay, so so sure. So in the in the first place, uh, yeah, I, 
when I use these terms, I'm trying my best to just be honest as I see it. And when it comes to you, we've had plenty of private conversations. So when I, when I say I don't think you're a real seeker, it, it's based on what I know about you. Um, I would never say that about David Smalley, and maybe I get to know him that sort of thing. From what I've seen on here, he's, he seems to qualify, in my opinion, as a real seeker. So what I'm talking about there is it, this comes up in the context of, you know, why, why does God let uh, rational people reach the, what I call the point of no return and, and get condemned when, you know, they have a rational disbelief? In Christianity so it's sort of implying well it's no not through any fault of their own um, so my notion of being I think that one has to be a real seeker in order for God to reveal the truth to them uh, about Christianity and, and to achieve their salvation so basically there are three criteria there I just think number one you have to be open-minded sincerely open-minded to the truth if, if you learn that Christianity is true be open to it. If you learn that Islam is true, then be open to it. Um, and the second one is that uh, there has to be a measure of actively seeking the truth. You can't just sit down and say, you know, God, come to me and reveal yourself to me, or I'm not doing anything. Uh, you got to get out there like what David Smalley did in, in his search and try to uh, seek out the truth to the best of your ability. And the, these criteria are all qualified you know, relative to the individual. Some people are smarter than others. Some people have access to different resources. Like, you know, some people don't have the internet or something. So I have more of a responsibility to seek out than others might. Um, and then the third one uh, is once you discover that truth, you should be willing to submit to it and, and obey or follow that truth. Um, now, the qu added last qualification on the real seeker bit um, that I add is that I actually think there are some real seekers. For for example, I again, I, I don't know David Smalley that long at all, um, but I, I might say I think he is a real seeker here. Or Andrew, uh, for example, is, is one of David's uh, Johnson's friends. He's an atheist, and I do believe he is a real seeker based on some of the conversations I've had, but yet God hasn't revealed Christianity to him. So... The qualification is that God is obligated to reveal the truth to any real seeker before the point of no return. So before the, the before the loss of a chance for salvation or something like that. Um, so that's that's my notion of being a real seeker. Um, in terms of being, I don't. I before don't you know go to that one, would you uh, just say for the audience, it's okay if you reveal something personal? Why you think I'm not a real seeker? Uh, so that they have something to to measure it against. Sure. So you, for example, explicitly stated that you're not even open to considering certain evidences that are brand new to you. Like, for example, I brought to you the Shroud of Trin. You just don't even want to look at it. Um, another thing in terms of your past, when you were going through your studies um, and studying, you know, you were a Christian and you were desperate. You wanted Christianity to be true. I sort of asked, okay, that's great, but that's not being open-minded. That's being closed-minded. That's you saying, I want what I want to be true. Um, so that's not correct. you got to be open to Islam. Did you study Islam at all? Did you study any other religions? Or was it just my particular fundamental Baptist version of Christianity is true? And if it's not, then the heck with everything. Um, so yeah, I, I think you're close-minded in that way, and these are explicit statements that you've made in the podcast. So that that's why I attribute you as being a, a false seeker or a non-real seeker. Okay, and just just for the sake of time, on the true Christian uh, question, do you believe that true Christians can fall away mm -hmm. and become atheists, or were they ever true Christians to start with? Uh, so I, in the first place, I don't know if I've ever called said that you weren't a true Christian. I'm not sure if I said that. Uh, but in terms of what a true Christian would be, it, it's uh, so yes, I do think that true Christians can apostatize. I, I do believe in that it, that it is possible someone can grieve or quench the Holy Spirit uh, and then eventually fall away from the faith. There, there are clear warnings in the Bible against that. So I I believe it's uh, a true phenomenon. Um, 
Yeah. So what what would be a true Christian? So I I take a mere sort of a mere Christianity approach in that if you're a Christian that subscribes to the fundamentals of the faith in terms of essential doctrines and belief, you know you you have faith um, and believe that the propositions of the deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus are true. Uh, you're willing, you've repented from your sins, and you're willing to obey uh, that truth and, and live as best you can with the help of the Holy Spirit, a, you know, a life devoted to God. Uh, so that I think that's how I would define a true Christian. Okay, uh, David, you've heard uh, Dale lay it down for real seeker, true Christian. What do you have to add or take away? Wow. Um, well, uh, I, I want to, what first jumped out of me is when he said, I brought you the shroud of Turin and you rejected that. I mean, I'm not sure how much you guys have gone into that, but the shroud of Turin was carbon dated and shown to be from the medieval era. Yeah. Uh, so, so Dale not, was a huge shroudy. Uh, he's, he's got a, yeah, he's got a very long, done, long series. On yeah, I'm, I'm sure he's going to have problems with the study. I suppose there was a study in, 2013 i remember that said it was dated to the area to the era of christ and then another one done in 16 15 16 and another one in 18 and the all the other three came back showing that it was actually from medieval times it's not any even close to being from even the time of christ let alone just believing that something with bloodstains on it came from jesus i mean it's just so far-fetched um i I was open to it originally i i I was open to it i like you said being a seeker (laughs) <laughs> open to it <clears throat> and then reading and reviewing the scientific analysis of it and then it seems that the only ones who was, who are saying that it's from the era of Christ are Christian websites and believers or scientists who are somehow employed by Christian universities all of the other ones who don't have any skin in the game are saying that it's from you know medieval times so I, I would say Dale that it's important to distinguish someone rejecting you know saying no evidence is, is available, which I believe that, that David probably is open to new evidences. Uh, which For the I record, think would make, I am. Yeah, which would make him a seeker, but that doesn't mean if you're not open to all evidences that you're not a seeker, meaning, um, you know, if, if I mean, I, you could come up with ridiculous, I mean, I've had them on my show where people claim that, one guy claimed that he was nearly choked to death by a demon, and Jesus showed up and fought the demon off and saved him. I'm not going to accept that as evidence and suddenly become faithful. And the fact that I reject this story, and by the way, I drove deeper into that guy's story. Turns out he was heavily on drugs that night, which he didn't reveal on the podcast originally. He tells me off fair that he was on drugs and that he lied to me during the show. Um, so that that kind of stuff... Me rejecting someone's drug-induced, you know, demon choking him out or whatever is is not. It doesn't make me not a seeker because I'm not willing to consider that. Um, there are certain levels of of reasonable scientific data that I think one one should accept, and the Shroud of Turin does not fall in line with something that that is reasonable to accept. Okay, so one thing just to follow up out of curiosity, then, so you wouldn't necessarily say we just reject the evidence from the Shroud of Turin. This is just a, a case study, an example. Um, you've looked at the evidence. You were open to it, as you said, right. and you it wanting. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that would qualify as, as being an open-minded person. That's the, perfect. The same was true for me. Where where were you when, uh, where were you when I said the same because thing? Because I don't believe it is true. I, oh, okay. You, I, don't, I haven't <laughs> looked at the, the Yes, evidence. I have. I looked at the evidence lots. I just didn't, by the time you came along... And wanted me to look at it again. I had no stomach for it. I, I so just because I wouldn't look at it again. Yeah, the shroud. Just because I wouldn't look at it again with you, and, and to to consider your take on it doesn't mean that I didn't look at it and consider it. I did. I I did some time ago. Shroud's been around for a while. Okay, so let me just say this because I that's fine. That maybe I misunderstood you when we were talking. That that wasn't the that I got, but that that's fine. So if if that's true, if, if you guys are open minded and you're you're looking at both sides, not just the skeptical side or the pro shroud side, but you know, give it give both sides an honest shot. Look at the evidence on both sides. 
um, and then you find the evidence wanting, of course, that's that's acceptable. Um, yeah, um, I can't dispute that. And I would say, great, you guys are real seekers and just maintain that. And I, I believe God, it's on God now to reveal the truth to you before you guys reach the point of no return, whenever that oh. is. Oh man, I was, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was actually just about to say this, this whole conversation or idea, anytime these debates come up, I typically answer them very shortly and then, and then address the fact that I think the entire focus of the conversation is a sidestep. It's a sidestep to avoid the problem of divine hiddenness. Mm -hmm. I don't know wh exactly what it would take. And here's, here's been my answer. When Christians say, what would it take to change your mind? I don't know. I don't know that anybody knows for sure. I can tell you, I think, oh, if you appeared right here, well, if you appeared right here, I might just assume I'm having some sort of hallucination. If someone, may, you know, I don't know exactly what it is. But you know what? If God exists, he knows. He knows what it would take to convince me. He knows what it would take to convince David. He knows what it would take to convince Richard Dawkins and Steven Pinker. He knows what it would take to convince all of us. Yeah. And he remains hidden in that respect. So to put the onus on the simple human, with the simple fallible human with so much limited information to run around bumping into things on earth and trying to learn multiple languages and put this scrap of a piece of paper with this scrap of a piece of paper and use carbon dating techniques to try to, 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 to make us jump through all of these hoops and the punishment is paradise and the reward is damnation. It's, it's a bit twisted to put the onus on the simple minded human. Yeah. If you're God and you're out there and you're listening and you truly want to save souls, whatever it is that will convince us, especially those of us with, followings with large followings of of other atheists you know what it would take to convince us do it problem solved yeah um yeah so i i i would say 95 99 percent agree with you the, the only thing i would say is so I, I believe it's a joint responsibility we we on our end have to be real seekers and from what i've heard i don't think you guys dispute the criteria the conditions themselves um, so that's fine. That's our part. Then it's on God to take it the rest of the way and, and reveal that truth to us. If we go past that point of no return and we are real seekers, then I can blame God. That's his fault. So then let me, then let me ask you a question. Yeah. If I was not a real seeker, if I was like this bum David over here. Who is who is not a real seeker? Not at all. Apparently not. And God, <laughs> and God wanted to save his soul anyway and reveal himself. Do you believe God could do it? Yes, of course. Well, um, right there, that proves that your prerequisite that one must be a real seeker is not valid. It is no. not a prerequisite. God could save us whether we're seekers or not. So that's off the table. This is one hundred percent on God to not remain divinely hidden. Okay, okay, so yeah, just sort of my follow-up then, not not necessarily, um, because I think, so I believe in God's providence, right? He's omniscient, so he knows that for me, for example, I, I would say there's, uh, before I became a Christian, I just converted back in May of last year. Um, this was after me doing years of research as a a non-Christian, but as a general theist and studying sort of the evidences and that sort of thing, um, it's like saying, well, why didn't God reveal himself to you two years ago? Why May 5th of 2018? Why not 2016? That, that would have been better. So I think that God reveals himself at the appropriate time for the individual to achieve his ultimate end of saving as many souls as possible. So it might be good that I had to go through such a long period of, of grappling with my doubts and, and studying the evidences and then be converted right when I was. It, it might be better overall for to have David Smalley convert, um, you know, five years from now or something like that. You, you've gone through the dogma debates and, and gotten, you know, met so many people and that sort of thing and heard so many arguments. Um, so God might know 
okay, it's better at that particular time rather than right away. So it's not like if you fulfill the real seeker, boom, that activates God. You got to reveal yourself right then and there. Uh, does that does that make sense at all? Yeah, but I think um, saying that God is on some sort of delay, um, it just again it just creates more problems and questions because the reality is look my my show and th this is not to tip my own hat it's to it's to draw a point of reference my show has literally touched hundreds of thousands of people and i know there are people uh, the vast majority of my listeners became atheists because of reading sam harris or richard dawkins or something like that watching debates they converted they deconverted themselves and then found my show to basically and what my show has helped them with is how to live this way, how to move forward, how to have communication with the religious family members or whatever. But there is a handful of people who came to my show as Christians and stopped believing from listening to my show. Now, I don't take credit for that. I think they deconverted themselves and allowed themselves to be open to it. But the reality is there are certainly people who came here as Christians deconverted because of the conversations they heard on my show and will surely pass away before God converts me to Christianity in his grand plan. Then I would have to ask you what happens to those people. Are they just collateral damage and they go to hell before God uses me to become a believer? I mean, again, we're, we're getting into these potential theodicies, right, that yep. really – don't make any sense without offering more more questions fair enough okay so I, I do i do just a side note guys i'm gonna i want to send you both something in our little skype window here i'm just a page just for later because you said he was a huge shroudy um a quick search turned up uh there's actually something from uh, the independent uh uk website which cites studies from 1988 on the shroud of turin and it actually has quotes and confessions from the artist who created it in the 1300s um, yeah. as a money scam. So I, I would invite uh, Dale to have a look at that, and then we could talk about it on a later episode or whatever. If you guys want to have me back on, I would love to do it. But I, I wanted to send you that link so you guys would have the research for it. I, I can almost guarantee you without having seen the uh, data you've sent over, Dale has seen it, memorized it. Uh, cata cata <laughs> cataloged it. Uh, be open and, and read it. it. I haven't seen that article, so I'm going to see. It. But yeah. where where did it go? It left the. Oh no! I pasted it in here. Let me do it again for you guys. It's oh. it's like I, I I know how to get it. You know how to okay, yeah, David? Yeah, yeah, give it to me. I I, to yeah, it. I'm I'm open. I'm going to read this. Yeah. I, I try cool. to. Yeah, thanks, David. I uh, asked. I appreciate that. Cool. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so I'm going to combine questions four and five because they're so similar, and uh, I think these are kind of fun. Uh, I think at the end of the day, the rubber kind of meets the road here. The criteria for choosing to worship God and follow Jesus. Now, let's just assume that um, there is a Jesus and also that there is a God and that Jesus is God. So let's just assume that. What's the criteria? What's what? What is the criteria for you worshiping someone? I mean, is it enough that he's a powerful being? Is that is that what it takes? You worship the most powerful being that you can find. Is it that he created you? Therefore, you you owe worship because he made you. Um, Dale, why do you why do you find it so important to worship? God and David, why do you not worship God? Uh, and I, I'm just guessing that you wouldn't worship him even if even if he was real. Now, if the question five with that, and I'm just going to combine these and mash them up together uh, because it's kind of fun. Heaven, the ultimate prize. So, is it is it heaven? Is it is it the fact that he offers the best goodies, and that's the reason to worship him? I will go ahead and, and address this first. There's nothing that could make me worship. So there are plenty of things that could make me believe, but there's nothing that could make me worship. I'm going to give this one to uh, David Smalley first. Uh, so first, first question, yes or no, if God is real, 
do you worship him or not worship him? Which one? God or the Bible? Uh, type one, Mark one, Christian God. <laughs> no, no, and I love that you combine these questions. This is this is one of my favorite rants to go on. Um, you, you're spot on. Uh, what does it take to make someone worthy of worship? Uh, oftentimes on my show, I will put my Christian hat on and make so many assumptions just to meet them where their faith is. And I just pass through the things. Yes, 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 yes. And I get there with them. And then I go, even with my Christian hat on, the God of the Bible does not follow Christian morals. If the God of the Bible were a guy running for president, you would probably reject him on morality alone. You wouldn't go vote for someone who had killed millions of people or flooded an entire town, let alone the entire earth, stricken people with diseases and plagues to prove a point, hardened the heart of the Pharaoh, and then started killing every firstborn in his village as punishment because you hardened his heart so that he wouldn't listen to you. It's just, it's so maniacal, it's so brutal, it's so archaic. He does not fit into Christian morality, even if you are a Christian. And so I often put that hat on and have those discussions, and then I go, look, if you were to prove to me beyond all shadows of doubt that this God was real, he is not worthy of worship. I don't think Christians listening to my voice right now would engage in any of the behaviors that God did in the Old Testament, which tells me they worship a God that has a lower moral standard than they do as a human being. They wouldn't treat people the way God has. They have a higher morality than the God they worship. And so to assume that this awful creature is the very source of our morality is the first mind-boggling assertion. And then to go beyond that and say, but don't worry, your reward for remaining faithful is to go sit at the feet for all of eternity of the only being that could have stopped the suffering and chose not to. So your reward is to go sit with the guy that could hear you screaming in pain during your rape and didn't stop it. Your reward is to go to the guy who allowed you to get the leukemia, the only one who could have cured it, chose not to, watched you live 11 years of absolute pain and torture, watched you suffer, watched you die, had the pain to stop it, chose not to, but don't worry, your reward is to worship at his feet for eternity. I say the entire concept of worship and then your reward is more worship for eternity of the only guy who could have prevented these absolute disasters from happening and chose not to for some mysterious reason is agonizingly painful to think about. So there's no way I could step into that mindset. Okay, so let me just make it a little bit harder for you then before I throw it over to Dale. Can you create a God in your mind? Can you imagine a God that would be worthy of worship? And what would that look like? <laughs> the kind of God who would be worthy of worship wouldn't demand it. <laughs> You sound so much like me during this segment. I'm going to have to roll back the tape to make sure that I wasn't the one talking. <laughs> so, so with that, Dale, why do you worship this monster? Okay. Um, interesting. So, yeah, that, I, I actually did appreciate your take on that, uh, David Smalley there. So, yeah, thank you for that. I, I think that it is important. I mean, the God of the Bible, it's its definitely not worthy of worship if it's all-powerful or even omniscient or, uh, or that sort of thing um, on its own. I, I think it's all of God's attributes combined are what make him worthy of worship. And one of the, the most necessary criteria, uh, because I, I think the max, the uh, evil God challenge is something that's one of the most uh, substantial objections to belief in a good God uh, in general, let alone the Christian God. Um, so yeah, I think it's important that the God that we're worshiping has to be morally perfect. Uh, he is the ground for necessary moral values and truths, uh, or yeah, necessary moral truths, which includes principles, duties, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, I liked David's point there, that the God that's worthy of worship wouldn't demand it. Um, I just think it's a bit incomplete. I, I would say wouldn't demand it 
for their own selfish purposes. But some Christians ha have argued, look, we're God telling us, commanding us to worship him is for our benefit. We're, we're religious creatures by nature. We, we, it's good for us to worship moral perfection. Sorry, just a quick cut in. We're religious by nature, but God gave us that nature, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I can see a counter coming there. Um, so, so yeah, in, in terms of salvation, uh, me, me and David had a show on this. Uh, achieving our salvation is us achieving our ultimate purpose, what God um, created us for in the first place, but got fouled up because of the fall. Um, so this is sort of God redeeming or correcting creation. Um, I, what, sorry, what was your question on salvation exactly? I forgot. Oh, well, so it was about uh, worship, and also I threw in heaven as the ultimate prize. Is is that a reason why we should worship? Is that Do you even consider heaven the ultimate prize? Um, sure, yeah. Yeah, of, of course. Salvation, I would say, because it's new heavens, new earth. It's a new creation. Um, yeah, but that's course. that's incentive for you to worship this God. So isn't that isn't that kind of a selfish incentive? Um, so I think that to some measure, um, there does have to be something in it for us when we, um, you know, choose to obey a certain religion or something. So, for example, with Buddhism, the ultimate goal of Nirvana doesn't appeal to me. So. If the Christian God is true and he's morally perfect in that, he's he's a being worthy of worship, he's created us for a specific purpose that is good both for him, right? Having relationships is is good. The more relationships with sentient beings, the better. That's why salvation is a good goal. But at the same time, it's also good for us. So it's it's a mutual benefit. It's not all about God or it's not all about me. It's about people and that sort of goes back to david smalley's thing about humanism um yeah humanism is great but i would go with peopleism god is a person or multiple persons actually um so doing what's best for persons as many people as possible that includes divine ones or or human ones and that's what i think salvation offers us it's, it's a chance to go back to what god originally intended for us and as an omniscient omnipotent uh, morally perfect being, he knows what's best for us much better than we do in our fallen fallen state. So, so Dale, let me let me ask you: Do you believe that people are more important than beliefs? Yes. Okay. Well, that's huge. Most believers don't answer that way. That's actually a, a T-shirt that um, Kansas City Oasis sells at their secular events that people are more important than beliefs. And that at the end of the day is I think one of the most important things that 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 Christians can come to terms with. Yeah. So I think yeah, that, a, a that, single yeah. oh, sorry. And, and, there's, and there's another there's another sort of prerequisite that a single good deed done by a single good heart is greater than a thousand heads bowed in prayer. Do you believe that's true? Uh so so sorry say that again. I was just writing something down. Oh, a single good deed done by a single good heart is greater than a thousand heads bowed in prayer. Um, well, I think a thousand heads bowed in prayer is a good thing as well in itself. Uh, so I don't know if I would agree with that one necessarily, but I agree with the, the intent behind that saying. Like, I, I think that... Um, well, well, hold on, though. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back on that and challenge it, because just a moment ago you said that peopleism, right, this thing that you've created, I suppose, where you're like, let's help each other, let's be there for each other, people are important, you uh, acknowledge that people are more important than beliefs, mm -hmm. but when we put that into practice and say, okay, a person, a single good deed done by a single good heart is greater than a thousand heads bowed in prayer, well, the thousand heads bowed in prayer are human beings just sort of murmuring things to a God they hope is there. So it kind of contradicts your idea. If, if you believe that the prayer, a thousand people praying, mm -hmm. is greater than a single good deed done for another person, then maybe you think beliefs are more important than people. So how do you reconcile those two? Or maybe you'd like to change one of your answers. 
Sure. Uh, no, I don't think I would like to change, actually. So the, the way I would reconcile that is, so number one, as I said previously, I think that those thousand people bowing their heads in prayer is a good thing in and of itself. It, it's good for them and it's good for God. Uh, but I would modify this and, and say that, so maybe it depends on what the good deed, the single good deed that you have in mind is, and it's a matter of priorities. What, um, so for example, if I, could, if, if my friend said, you know, do me a favor and help me move on Sunday during church hours, uh, I think it's better in that case to go and, you know, set, set aside Sunday's mornings for the worship of God at, at your church service and that sort of thing. But if I was on my way to church and I saw someone dying on the street, okay, well, I can skip church. You know, saving a life is more important than that. So that's what I would say is it, I guess it depends on the nature of the good deed that we have in mind. Sure. That sounds a bit more like, you know, being a consequentialist, which I could definitely get down with on some level. Um, but I guess the, the point of keeping it generic is this idea that secular people hold, that humanists hold, that is, do real stuff. Actually make a difference. Don't just go to your closet or Facebook and say, I'll pray for you. How about you offer assistance? How about you offer an actual good deed done from a single good heart? Because thousands and thousands of people talking to the air and hoping it reaches God is not as good as someone actually putting that into action and making positive things happen. And at the end of the day, that's what humanism is. Sure. So, right. I, I hear you on that. I, obviously, I, I disagree. That I, I think that praying to God is real because the Christian God is real and it, it, it can have an impact. But here's what I would say where we can agree. It's not either or. It can be both and. Um, um, yeah, you, you can pray for that person and actually, you know, get out there and make a donation or do something. So, yeah, that, that's what I would say to that is maybe consider if the Christian God is true, you know, try a both and approach. And that's it. And, uh, that's, that's our time. Uh, David Smalling. Excellent. Dale. Excellent. Oh, thank you. Jeez, I, 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 I that declare <laughs> I declare that neither of you should use notes or have preparation for any of your shows again. I, I rarely do anymore. <laughs> because, <laughs> I usually just wing it now. This is this is better. <laughs> it's more this fun is, being real, isn't it? Yes. Than, than being like, well, an author in 1884 once wrote. <laughs> ah, shut up. Tell me what's in your brain. That's yes. somebody else's. This is so much better. So thank you. Um, thank you to both of you for playing along with my little game show. And uh, the winner is me, of course. <laughs> I think the winner is the audience for the having winners. a conversation and, and an honest you know, dialogue on these issues. It's fantastic. Look, there's, there's a backstory to what I'm going to say, but it's a, it's a uh, dare I say, miracle that uh, David uh, decided to do the show. Uh, with us today anyway and so special thanks for for getting through all of that and and doing this with us the audience will very much appreciate it we will link to your mighty works and not despair and uh, we will definitely see if we can have you back perhaps sometime in the summer uh, if that's not too soon because um, yeah this has been fantastic Cool. I appreciate it. Thank you. All Thanks right. so much, David. And uh, next week, I usually say who we've got uh, on deck for next week, but quite frankly, I didn't put that in my notes. And so Just I have... Yourself. Oh, yes. See, I keep track of this. <laughs> <laughs> who, is it? who is it? Drew Sokol. Drew. Oh, Drew. Sokol. Who's you know. done my show? Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. Oh, gonna be fantastic so we'll um we will uh talk to you then and have a great week everybody all right bye-bye everyone take care